discuss it and manip it's not integrated into the main discussion. That means it's just like a random paragraph that is there because you know that I told you to include this discussion, right? Or you've seen it in the you know subject guide or you read it in you know something along those lines uh, in Khan's means and stuff. <coughs> and then it is not integrated into the discussion and it, it doesn't therefore contribute to the analysis of the argument, right? So that is something that you please need to be cognizant of when you are crafting, uh, you know, your arguments in your answer. Think, you know, I, I would recommend this, right? I, and I think a lot of students don't do this. Stop writing, right? I'm sorry, when you stop writing, when you have stopped writing, right? That means when you finish your answer or halfway through your answer, please take a step back and read your answer. I often find that, you know, the least the material is all there, right? Content-wise, you are I cannot fault students, right? But structure-wise, there's often something wrong. There's no flow. There is, um, you know, like, like paragraphs that have impo important information but do not connect back to the question. I find that this happens very often with this course, with this level two course, right? Why? Because the questions are a little bit more abstract. Or the question is a little bit more, um, you know, generic in terms of, you know, asking you to, to write an answer, you know, relating to a specific idea. So please do not put in paragraphs of material for the sake of putting in a, a discussion, for the sake of jumping in, uh, you know, a theory or so on. It needs to be integrated into the major discussion. So if you're referring to pan of fried eggs, then how does, how is this pan of fried eggs relevant to your answer? That's the point down here. Right, so I would always recommend. Right, I know you may not have that much time in the final exam. Right, okay. I I I, I cannot. Uh, I re at this point I do not know how long they're giving you this year for the final exam. Right, it has changed over the last two years. You know, and if it's an online exam or physical exam or whichever. But I highly recommend, and this is what I have done as a student all my life. Right. This is what I still do today also when I want to write an exam answer or I'm preparing something you know, like this for y'all or whatever, right? I always have a piece of rough paper and I always plan. I always write down, jot down at least a couple of points so that I do not forget. Exam anxiety will get the better of you. You already should know this by now, right? Uh, if you are the people who are unfortunately exposed to only ex online exams so far in, in UOL, then all the more you need to think about this, right? Please plan your answer. Write down your TC statement. Please think carefully. I want to see. Please think carefully, right, about how you are going to structure your, <clears throat> your entire answer. <clears throat> right? What is it that you, you want to, you know, what is the end goal of your answer, right? What are you linking to what? What kind of, you know, arguments are you referring to and so on? So if you're talking about okay, I don't need to really. if you're talking about pan of fried eggs, right? The rationale is that how does it connect? Where is it applicable? How is it applicable to the regional uh, to the African regional context? Okay, all right. So that is what uh, you know I wanted to point out you know by way of discussing this. All right. So when you look at pan of fried eggs, right? Uh, you know summarize. Okay, I've given you in detail down here. Please don't replicate the whole slide into you know your answer. Just summarize, right? This one is for your understanding purpose. Right, okay, so at a global level, your international actors linked by this keyword is important, a thin, okay, thin form of international society, few shared practices and values, uh, right, okay, uh, but you have got your major rules of membership and rules of behavior that govern, you know, uh, you know, interactions among states, right, okay. Then at the regional level, you've got the thicker sets of formal informal institutions, right. Uh, in comparison to global counterparts. So how does this logic of thin 
uh, sorry, thicker sets of formal informal institutions, right? How do we see it? Can you please write this down? How do we see it playing out <clears throat> in the African context, right? Okay, so do in, indeed, do we see thicker sets of uh, interactions, right? Or thicker, sorry, sorry, thicker sets of formal and informal institutions, right? in the African regional context. Same thing, right? Do you see thicker sets of, uh, in, uh, of formal and informal institutions, say, for example, in the EU? Do you see the same type of thick, uh, same degree of thickness, right? Formal and informal institutions in the EU in comparison to the African region, right? So this is the application. If you're just going to say, oh, Buzan say X, Y, and Z about the kind of fried eggs, so what? That is, that would be the Marcus reaction. So what? Okay, yeah, I know you know about English school. I know you know about, you know, the pan of fried eggs. So what? What is, why is it relevant to this question? Right, so you need to find a way to integrate it into your major argument. Understand? Okay, all right. So Buzan refers to, you know, this logic about the hypothetical uh, you know, pan of fried eggs, right? So what you want to highlight is that, uh, you know, the uh, states in the global system, they belong to the thin pluralist international society, which is the egg white, right? And then the global or the sub-global, the regional clusters, they are more thickly developed, the egg yolk, right? Okay, so that is the basic idea that you want to refer to when you talk about, you know, Buzan and the uh, eggs, right? Okay. So what you want to, you know, uh, highlight is that what you're supposed to see as a result of this thicker, uh, you know, formal and informal institutions that bind the states together, glue the states together, gel the states together, or supposed to gel the states together, is that you're supposed to see compatibility, harmony, right, existing. So this is the theory. When you take this theory and you apply it to the African region, do you indeed see this playing out or not? That is how you need to integrate the argument, right? Okay, so is it, you know, it is even possible for uh, regional societies to be strong rivals, right? But even though they are in disagreement with each other as a result of particular conflicts, as a result of particular events, right? You still would see some adherence, right, to these kinds of, you know, institutions, right? Okay, so what you need to think about, right, is that, you know, what, when you look at these regional societies, some of these questions are actually quite relevant, right? That means, what is the lowest common de denominator of interstate society? What is it? What is the most basic level of interaction that exists between the states on a regional level, right? Okay, uh, you know, do you have uh, intervention, right? What kind of intervention, humanitarian intervention, legal, you know, is it legal? Uh, you know, do states uh, intervene in the domestic affairs of one another or do they, uh, you know, guard their sovereignty so much that they do not want to compromise on their sovereignty and therefore they do not intervene in the affairs of the others, right? Uh, how legitimate, uh, you know, in, is it in terms of the rules and norms of a regional interstate society, right? Like what you see in EU, what you see in Arab League, right? And then what do you, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, intervention do you see between the different regional international uh, interstate societies? So on different levels, right? You know, how does intervention uh, play out? How does relationship between states play out? How close, how closely related are they, right? Uh, you know, do you see more close relationship among states, uh, sorry, between states within the region? Do you see block to block relationships? Right and so on. Right, so these are the some of the you know questions that you basically want to ask. But my focus, I mean, I, I would think that your focus really would be more the case of you know the the logic of the thicker interactions versus the thinner interactions. That's basically what you need to you know focus on you know uh, more right in comparison to the others. Right, so in a pure Westphalian interstate society, right. Uh, what you would think about, you know, is the intervention is, you know, considered to be illegal, illegitimate, right? Basically, the idea is that sovereignty becomes the organizing principle. That's why why we say intervention uh, is illegal or illeg illegitimate. The question, you know, really arises, you know, when you think about um, intervention, collaboration, uh, you know, uh, you know, we from the outside perspective. State, uh, we may say that you know this is cooperation, this is integration, this is collaboration. From you know within the region's perspective, 
uh, the states who are wearing their realist lenses would probably call it intervention. And why would they think that you know any kind of intervention in the domestic affairs of their state is considered to be illegitimate? Because sovereignty is the organizing principle, right? That's the rationale where it stems from, right? Okay. Uh, so you know you are interfering in the domestic affairs of my state. That's unacceptable to me, right? And the question really you know then remains is that at what point does it become legitimate for the international community or in this case the regional actors? to intervene in the domestic affairs of the state, right? Uh, and the main point, you know, that intervention is, uh, I think you all are familiar with this logic of interventionism, right? The main point, you know, behind interventionism, uh, you know, in whatever form, whether it's to render assistance or humanitarian aid or whichever, you know, whatever for whatever reason they are intervening in, right? Is that, you know, it is only justified should, um, you know, a particular state be not fulfilling the conditions of sovereignty. Meaning, remember the Montevideo Convention uh, of what it means to be a sovereign state, right? Protect your population, protect your territory, conduct diplomatic relations, and so on, right? Rule over a specific territory. So if you have a state that is not protecting its territory, not protecting its population, right? That would be perhaps the only time where we would say a state forfeits its sovereignty and therefore it becomes legitimate to intervene. In all other cases, intervention or any form of intervention is round pot, right? Especially in regions which are highly characterized by uh, sovereignty as an organizing principle, okay? Okay, so, you know, that's where, you know, you, you get the idea down here, right? You know, any kind of intervention, any kind of, uh, you know, um, what is perceived as intervention, right, is seen as illegal, uh, illegitimate, right? But if you have a thick, solidarist international society, right, and you have particular approaches to states understanding what sovereignty means, right? How that how sovereignty stands up, you know, uh, in terms of a regional identity, like what you see in the EU, establishment of agreements of, you know, elements of, or, or pillars of that society, which, you know, refer to things like democracy or particular ideals or a Europeanness and so on, like what we saw in EU, right? Uh, rights of individuals and non-state actors and so on. That would make, you know, any kind of intervention or, any kind of uh, cooperation, integration, you know, seem to be more legal and legitimate. So that's basically what you see in the EU. So can you see the clear distinction here? This slide in particular, right? Okay, can you please write this down? This slide in particular, applicable to arguments or a paragraph where you're crafting an argument to say that, okay, this is how, right, these two different regions, or this is how these states in these two different regions view or understand the importance of regionalism, you will understand the importance of the regional organization per se. But this is how they perceive the interactions, right? And this is how they are distinct from each other. So if you are writing an argument or writing a paragraph, you know, that is related to the comparison between, right, this, these two regions, right, then this would be something that you would include in your argument. Are, are we okay on this one? Everybody clear? Understand? the logic behind this argument here, yeah? okay? And we need me to explain again? Okay, right? Okay, background on Africa, okay, actually very simple to understand, all right? Uh, you know, you know, shed your preconceived notions or anything, all right? Just, just, you know, just, just listen, okay? All right, actually very easy to understand. Okay, so what you want to, you know, uh, you know, be able to highlight is particular inherent characteristics in your exam answer right if you're going to uh, you know write an argument on on, on africa uh, i would expect to see a paragraph on the background because why why is the background necessary it sets the tone if you want to subsequently say uh, sovereignty is the organizing principle where did this argument come out from how come sovereignty is an organizing principle why are they so protective over their borders why are they so protective, right, over making decisions independently of a regional organization, right? That's the argument down here that we are referring to, right? Why is it that regionalism and inter regional integration hasn't worked in the same degree as how it has worked, right, in the international, uh, sorry, in the EU, right, in the in the European region, right? Okay, so that is the argument. Sorry, sorry. 
that is the argument that you want to, to uh, make when you are discussing uh, you know, uh, uh, the background of Africa, right? So this is why it becomes necessary to include this background because it sets the tone. Right, it starts to explain why you cannot just suddenly say that oh you know they are very fiercely uh you know uh protective over their sovereignty or their nationalities and so on. Why so? Where did this stem out from? Right. So that's why you need to provide at least a, a relatively you know uh you know decent background. Right. Talk about the things you know associated the inherent characteristics. So you want to talk about things like you know um the cleavages, the comp uh, the composition of African society in comparison to European society. So what that would help you to explain the ideals, the values that are associated with the region. Okay? So what you want to see, right? And also, also you want to talk about, you know, it in terms of uh, the capacities of the region, the capacity of the, of the various states within the region as well. Okay. So what you want to highlight, right, is that uh, it is a uh, very it's one of the largest continents, right? Major source of natural resources, right? So this is where you get the idea of um, you know just remember I mentioned the idea of whether regionalism or regional integration contributes to the welfare of the individual states or the majority of the people. This is where you will get the idea from because if it's a region, right, and many states within the region have got high levels of natural resources that are subsequently sold off, right? A lot of these states in the region, they belong to which category in the world systems theory? They belong to the periphery and the semi-periphery. Am I right? Correct. Okay. So that, that, that's the rationale down here. So they belong to the periphery, the semi-periphery. What does world systems theory and the logic of core versus semi-periphery and periphery tell you? That there is a cycle of, cycle of what? Your world systems theory. The core states do what to the periphery and the semi-periphery? Exploit as a cycle of? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What is the other word for world systems theory? What is the other phrase? How do we refer to world systems theory? It's a theory of what? So we D, cycle of, thank you, cycle of dependency, correct, right? So when you have a cycle of dependency, right, and you've got exploitation that does occur, right, how does that contribute then to the capacities and the developments of the state, of in individual states within the region? How does that contribute to the, the, the uh, welfare of the majority of the people is there a trickle down effect how does that contribute you've heard of this one the resource curse you've got a resource curse remember resource curse right okay when you have resource curse right uh states the the uh, okay sorry when you have resource curse it is a unique combination of a high level of natural resources plus what plus weak institutions poor governance correct Okay, so what happens with the resource curse and, 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 and this logic is that states either they, you know, uh, channel or they redirect the resources, or sorry, they, they redirect the revenue that they have gotten from selling off these resources, uh, you know, uh, back into their own coffers, right, back into their, you know, their kleptocratic pockets, right, they are very deep and it's not redistributed back to society. Second thing, Right when you talk about resource curse or the oil curse, right? Resource curse or oil curse, because some states in the African continent are very rich in oil, so like Nigeria, for instance, right? Okay. So when you've got uh, the, the resource curse, uh, you know because they're sitting on a nest egg of a very high num a very high level of natural resources, right? What happens is that they are not necessarily so, sorry, thank you, uh, Yipeng. Sorry, yeah, you said dependency. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see that. I didn't see your response. Thank you. Correct. You're, you're correct. Okay, sorry. Uh, when, you're, when you're sitting on a nest egg of a high level of resources, right, do you have the incentive to go out and seek, uh, you know, economic packs and, you know, uh, negotiations? You want to attract investments and so on. Do you necessarily want to do that also, right? So, you may have some of these, you know, leaders, state leaders, who do not necessarily, are not necessarily driven by this incentive to attract investment, okay? So this is part of the logic of the resource curse, right? Okay, and then you also have the logic of resource scarcity, 
uh, in in Africa, right? So not all, are all states within the African region blessed with a very high level of natural resources? No, not necessarily. Two, right? When you have high level of natural resources or you have natural resources, right? And you have poor governance, right? Okay, weak institutions. What happens when you have the logic of power vacuums, right? Resources are already scarce. You do not have an authority that is governing over these resources. What happens? You've got these competing, conflicting, uh, sorry, you've got these actors from competing or conflicting cleavages who are now fighting with each other in order to control these resources. That is what politics is about, is it not? Right? Politics is about, what's that famous phrase that we always use? Politics is about, hello, politics is about what? I'm going to start crying now. Politics is about who gets what, when, where, and how much. It's about the access to and distribution of resources. Right? Okay. Can you see? One statement. Major source of natural resources for the world's manufacturers and consumers. And what do we do? We expanded it. Right? And we not only expanded it, but we explained several different ideas related to it. Can you see? why the background is necessary. Can, we, can you see how we move from just look, talking about natural resources to talking about characteristics of the region, talking about how this impacts on regionalism? Can you see how you expand, right? This can easily just make up one paragraph already. Easy to argue? Correct. It's not difficult, right? Can you, can you see I, why, I'm, why I'm doing this is because I want to show you how you can simplify the argument, right? It looks complex, right? But actually it's not. Okay, all right? And these are things you already know. Dependency theory, you know. World systems theory, you know. Core versus periphery, you know. Kleptocratic, you know. Poor governance, you know. Right, right. It's just about pulling all of it together. Can you see? All right, okay. So now, no more fear, right? Okay, about, right, about, you know, writing about this background, correct? Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, you got no choice but to agree with me. Okay, then, uh, of, co of course, you know, um, you know, it faces some of the hu uh, greatest human challenges of any region, right? Two thirds of the population that live with HIV, for example, uh, you know, uh, you know, a total world population of those you know who live with HIV, basically, uh, unfortunately, in the African region, right? According to the UN AIDS report, <laughs> then, uh, you know, also complicated by the fact that you know, in terms of economic and social terms, right? You will find that you know, um, Africa lags behind the rest of the world. Right, any okay, like it's not, you know, it's, it's a dated uh, statistic, right? But you pull up any year statistic, you will find that right at the bottom of the of the uh, UN, uh, you know, uh, HDR, right, the report, right, you are bound to find a, a good number of African states right at the bottom of the ranking, okay. And then, uh, you know, you have got a lot of, you know, uh, deeply rooted structural obstacles, right? Like, you know, this, I mean, it's not applicable just 2016. Uh, it's not applicable to any, you know, uh, 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 era, right? Okay. Uh, deeply rooted obstacles, you know, like une unequal distribution of resources, right? Uh, you've got, you know, uh, unequal distribution of power and wealth. You've got extremely high levels of gender inequality. It's all the typical, okay, let's be honest. It's all, all stereotypical. Uh, you know, descriptions, descriptors of African region, right? Uh, and then when you look at political challenges, right? Remember just now I talked about the power vacuum. I talked about weak governance and so on, right? Basically, what you want to link back to is the logic of civil conflicts, right? So you've got many different conflicts. If you do, okay, I'll, let, let's be very uh, honest down here, right? If you do uh, an answer on Africa, I would expect you to have uh, at least some knowledge about at least one or two of the conflicts, right? The most easiest one to um, to remember and to explain, right, would be Rwandan genocide, right? Okay, that one, you know, we are all familiar with that one, okay? And another one, at least another one, maybe uh, Sudanese civil war, the Sudanese civil war, right? Or maybe the Somalian civil war, right? These, you know, the very popular ones, just have, a, you know, some background information, okay? All right, so uh, war in Darfur, uh, Sudanese civil war, South Sudanese civil war, Somalian civil war, all of this, you know, basically what do they represent? What, what is the implication of it? These are destabilizing, 
right? They destabilize large portions of the continent, right? They are extremely costly. Some of these are protracted, that means for a long period of time, okay? All right, so they're costly, they affect development, uh, you know, they're protracted. What do they do? Uh, when you have got conflict like this, right, and you've got a, a deadly combination or deadly cocktail of things like, you know, a high preponderance for, you know, the spreading of disease, right? You've got uh, things like, you know, uh, health security being impacted, food security being impacted, water security, right? Uh, it affects maternal health. It affects infant mortality, right? It affects, uh, you know, uh, and, then, and then it gets aggravated by environmental degradation, right? Climate change, right? You're already vulnerable societies and they are further impacted by these kinds of things, right? Then you've got displacement of people as a result of the civil conflict, right? So you've got, you know, disenfranchisement, you've got displacement of people, you've got people who exit mass exodus from one state to another state as a result of civil conflict, right? That's where you get the spillover effect, right? What you saw in the Rwandan genocide, sorry, what you see in the Rwanda, what you saw in the Rwandan genocide, they, you know, exited from Rwanda to uh, you know, uh, neighboring, uh, what's that, Congo, right, okay, so, uh, you know, this, what does this cause, you know, why is this destabilizing, reduced investor confidence, right, your infrastructure gets affected, right, it leads to power vacuum, power vacuum leads to further destabilization, what is this, this is a base, basically a description of a downward spiral, right, okay, all right, so that's, you know, how you, you, you know, pre uh, you know, uh, uh, set, you know, the tone for, you know, what you're going to discuss, so with, you know, with all of these challenges, this is why regional organizations become relevant to the argument, okay? All right. Basic structure, what you're looking at, right, is you're looking at, uh, you know, 54 fully recognized sovereign states, right? But as a result of uh, a large number, uh, long period of time, right, protracted uh, colonization and then subsequently decolonization. So first you have to scramble for Africa. Right, is when you know basically all the European states, you know, in the era of colonialism and so on, ran to you know grab different parts of Africa for themselves, right, to take advantage of the markets, take advantage of the natural resources, and so on. And subsequently, you've got the you know the the uh, decolonization process, right. So basically, what you see, right, apart from you know the variances in size and capacities and so on, what you also are looking at, right, is the logic of you see. I want to say the third bullet point, associated nationality. Nationalities are not natural or inherent, right? But it is state-created, right? Okay. And then compounded, right, with this state-created nationalities, right? Is this logic about cross-cutting cleavages, deep, intense cross-cutting cleavages, right? So you've got two major, you know, religions, Islam and Christianity, all right? Then you've got the tribal religions as well. So you've got, you know, uh, individuals that identify with, say, either Islam or Christianity. But at the same time, they also identify with the tribal religion. Then this identity gets complicated, becomes more complex, because they also identify according to the languages that they speak and their tribal affiliations. They come from particular ethnic, you know, tribes and so on. Right. Okay. So basically, what you're looking at, right, is competing cross-cutting identities. When you have competing cross-cutting identities plus an associated nationality, that means a state construct constructed nationality. What happens to the individual, right? Who, which, what, what are their loyalties, right? Okay. That complicates the way they see themselves, right? And that complicates the level of stability that that results right, in the region per se, right, okay, right, in a, in, a, in a country like, you know, Singapore already, right, you already have people, you know, asking Singapore a state or a nation, right, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a true Singaporean, right, you know, we, after this many years of nation building, we're still asking this question, right, compared to, uh, you know, and, and, and don't say that, you know, our history is complicated by a civil war and complicated by, you know, uh, any, any kind of, um, you know, uh, and things like decolonization and so on. What do we experience? We experience fall of Singapore. Our greatest reference point is to conflict is what Maria Hertog riots. And some people will say Little India riots for the newer generation. But that's about it, right? And yet, we have these complications related to identity. Now, magnify that, exacerbated 
in the African region, right? Can you, you understand how it relates to the logic of identity, how it relates to the logic of stabilization and stability, how states build themselves and so on, right? Okay. So basically the idea, you know, uh, you know, that you want to, you know, highlight is, you know, what, what this, what all of this leads to, right? How does it contribute to the development of, you know, a regional identity? You are already having a very complex national identity. How do you develop a regional identity? So the logic here is that when you look at the European region, you see European values. Can you replicate that scenario here? Question, yes, no, difficult, difficult, right? Uh, okay, okay. So many proposals, right, for Pan-African, can you please underline that? Pan-African, all right? Many proposals for Pan-African and sub-regional organizations. Basically, what you want to highlight is that the proposals for these organizations is because they wanted to contribute towards the development of the region, right? And if you talk about Africa, you need to talk about the logic of Pan-Africanism. Right, what it represents. Right, so I'm giving you a definition down there. Right, about you know how this is you know uh, intellectual movement aims to encourage, strengthen bonds of solidarity between all Africans. Right, so that means you know even looking at an international <coughs> that is <coughs> international diaspora. Right, uh, you know basically you are talking about you know the belief that unity among all of these different, uh, you know, uh, subgroupings, right, of peoples and so on, believe that unity is vital to economic, social, political progress, right? The aim behind mooting any kind of regional organization or pan-African organization, right, is that you want to unify, uplift African or African peoples, right, because they share this common history, common destiny, right? They've been trampled upon before, right? Now they've got their independence and their freedom and their sovereignty and their autonomy. And therefore, now the move, the, the way forward, right, is to ensure that the region, right, is gelled together, right, by this idea of unity. And, you know, in order to progress, right, you need to have this unity because the unity will then contribute to stability, right? So... Again, you know, simple logic, you know, what is the background, right? And why is it that they feel that there's a necessity, right, to bring the entire region together, right? To bring the entire, all the different states with their different variances in hard power, soft power, variances in capacities, variances in, you know, levels of development, variances in uh, religion, in ethnicity, tribal affiliations, nationalities, and so on. So if you didn't discuss that, Right, then it will be difficult to explain, right, why there was this desire to unify, right, these peoples. And why is it difficult to let this desire play out, you know, in terms of a successful regional organization. Can you see why the background now is important? Right? And the background basically lends itself to the discussion, right? To the background, in providing the background. Right, will help you to say, you know, why are you successful? Why not successful? Why difficult? Why, you know, uh, you know, what, what are the complexities associated with it and so on? Right? Okay, you understand? All right. So, you know, um, I've given you, you know, a couple of uh, videos and links down there. Please take a look at it. Right? Okay. Uh, then you've got, you know, uh, several different organizations. Like ECOWAS is one of the more common ones, right? Uh, Economic Community of West African States, right? Uh, that is the principal, um, uh, that is one of the major economic organizations. And the principal pan-African organization, which started off, right, which uh, was actually the OAU, which, which is what we're looking at today. Okay? All right. <coughs> okay. So basically what you want uh, to look at, right, is that, Obviously, you know, they were struggling already with autonomy and independence, right? So in the, the immediate aftermath, not like what you saw in the immediate aftermath of, um, of the World War II, right? Immediate aftermath of World War II for Europe, right? You had this scenario where they needed to pool their resources together for the coal and the steel. They didn't want to revert back to conflict, right? But that was one particular event that, you know, occurred in that particular time frame. And therefore... They were, a, they were looking at the idea of recovery and creating the organization. When you look at, you know, the, the African region, right, you will notice that decolonization did not occur all at the same period of time. It was, you know, over a period of time for several different states. Maybe the last state 
uh, you know, to be to receive independence was around the 1960s. All right, around that period, right? Okay, so it was a, a period where you know different states were you know basically achieving independence at different periods of time. So basically, that is you know the logic. It did not automatically produce a you know a climate that was encouraging for regionalism because what you see right now is that states are suddenly receiving independence. Now you've got this independence after such a long period of time. Right? And having experienced this cycle of uh, you know, the dependency, right? having experienced exploitation, having experienced you know, high levels of civil conflict and so on, you suddenly receive independence. Are you now going to take this independence and say, okay, I'll give up for my independence to a regional organization and cooperate with them? Is that going to be a natural react reaction among states? No. Right? So this is, again, common sense logic, right? This is, helps, you to understand, helps you to explain. This is why states reacted the way they did. So can you blame, can you blame them for wearing realist lenses you know, to a certain extent? Right? Can you blame them for wearing the realist lenses? Not really, right? Okay? And then what happens also is that there is not a high level of unity among the states who have now received independence. Why? Because of the different traditions or what I would refer to as a different colonial legacies, the legacy, colonial legacy. So you've got Anglophone, you've got Francophone, that means those that were British colonies, those that were French colonies, right? So they have different styles of administration, they have different attitudes towards, you know, uh, state formation and so on, right? So you've got divisions between Anglophone and Francophone states, you've got the radicals, you've got the new moderates, Right, you've got those that are you know pro democracy. You've got you know all of these artificial borders bequeathed by European colonialism. Go and if you're not if you're not already familiar, go and take a look at the map of Africa. Take a look at the map of Africa. One of the very unique maps, right? Why? Because one of the very few states, a uh, few continents where you see straight lines that divide. When you, you look at the map, right? There are a lot of straight lines, right? Other states all like like that, like that, like that right? Right? But you look at Africa, there are a lot of states that it actually, you know, the borders, right? The actual straight lines. Why? These borders are artificially constructed, bequeathed by your European colonizers, right? So that is where you get the logic of associated nationality, right? Okay? Okay. So what happens is that you've got, you know, an impetus as a result of the Congo crisis, right? And they wanted to create this sub-regional, uh, you know, uh, grouping. So what happened was you basically get the logic of three different uh, subgroupings, right? You've got the Casablanca, Brazzaville, and the Monrovia. Subsequently, these different subgroupings decided to come together, right, to form the OAU. But, 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 the logic is this. To start off with, are they of one united vision? They may have a united vision in terms of wanting to create a regional organization, but from the get-go itself, they are already split in opinion between these three different groupings, right? Okay, so what happens is that, you know, these three basically came together, right? And they eventually formed a loose association of sovereign, you know, authorities in 1963 under the auspices of the Organization for African, uh, Organization of African Unity. That's the OAU, right? Okay, so the rationale is basically, you know, you want to look at the idea that, you know, the, the background, what provides impetus to all of this, right? Effects of colonialism and, you know, sudden independence. We've got new government structures that are suddenly, you know, popping out, right? And also remember, when you have decolonization, right, okay, and you have the exit of the colonial structures or the, you know, exit of the colonial masters or colonial administrators, right? What does that equate to? That equates to a sudden lack of support. When you talk about a lot of African states, right, and even, you know, in the post-Cold War era, we will always refer to this logic where a lot of these states, unfortunately, have a crutch mentality. You know, crutch. Heard of crutch, you know, when you break a foot, then you've got the crutch that you have, right? Crutch mentality, meaning that, you know, they have been constantly relying on support from an external, you know, source for a long period of time, right? So what you have is a sudden lack of this support right, from, you know, your major powers or your colonizers that basically, unfortunately, had treated a lot of your African states, right, uh, like pawns, they exploited them because of, you know, the natural resources available, or they were exploited because of, you know, mercantilism or imperialism, or simply, 
right? You know, a lot of these uh, states who also engage in colonialism because they say, you know, uh, white man's burden and we'll rescue all of these underdeveloped barbaric states. You know, you've heard of all of these before, right? In the guise of colonialism and so on, right? Okay, so that is the rationale now here, right? So, you know, how does this then impact on how these different states view themselves, how they organize themselves into these different subgroupings, even though they were interested in creating a pan-African uh, organization, okay? All right, so, you know, the rationale is that why economic, sorry, why uh, regional integration became critical to Africa is because the important component of all of their developmental strategies, right, you know, was was un understood as best being driven by economic cooperation, right? So the economic rationale of overcoming, you know, all of the constraints of what they would experience individually because of this crutch mentality, because of these divisions that exist within the states, right? How then, you know, would they better function if they were as a group? So they had that idea down correctly. But subsequently, how did it play out? That was where the complications actually arose, okay? All right. <coughs> so what you see is that, you know, um, it's like a conundrum or, you know, a counterintuitive, you know, rationale that actually occurred within the OAU and the AU, right? Subsequently, you know, they were, you know, as a result of all of this background, right? I spent the time explaining this background because, you know, that is what sets the foundation for everything else, right? Later on, when you want to look at the institutional effects and so on, right? Uh, you know, the content is just there. You can, you know, just look at the content. But understanding how this actually played out the way it did is, is what is crucial down here, right? So, you know, the rationale is that, you know, they wanted regional integration, but they also, ironically, at the same time, counterproductively, right, they were interested in preserving status quo, right? So there's this, you know, inherent dilemma that is within, you know, the region itself, right? They are not inclined to delegate authority, uh, give up, you know, any kind of sovereignty away to a regional organization or any kind of external authority, right? Like what you did see in the EU, right? So it is run by states wearing their realist lenses. But go back to the question, can you blame them for doing so, right? Okay, uh, and this goes back, can you write down there? Number one is realist tendencies. Number two, right, it is the logic of sovereignty being the current organizing principle of the African international society, right? Okay, all right. So therefore, this then, you know, renders, uh, you know, this, um, you know, this uh, distaste against, sorry, they have this distaste against multilateralism, distaste against regionalism as a result of this. And as a result of this then, right, the final outcome or the final consequence is that the OAU and the AU are subsequently considered by many as relatively ineffective organizations, right? This is where it all stems from, right? So this would be like a thesis statement or this would be like a justification as to why you would say the OAU and the AU, right, is a, uh, in, you know, an ineffective organization in comparison to several other organizations that we've examined so far, right? So that's why I've got the idea of sovereignty is a key principle. You've got to make that connection. You cannot just dump the argument and say sovereignty is a key organizing principle. Where does it stem from, right? That's what you've got to explain first, right? Okay, so that's the rationale down here. Okay, I like the last phrase, uh, you know, uh, in the, on this slide down here, right? Given Africa's or African continent or African states, historical baggage of colonialism. You write the statement there, right? Basically, it encapsulates, uh, sorry, encapsulates <coughs> the entire you know, argument that you've made. It summarizes everything for you. So if you want to have a transitionary paragraph from first explaining you know, the background and then subsequently you want to explain why is it that the regional organization did not materialize the way it was supposed to have materialized or what, why it didn't materialize the way like the EU has materialized, right? This would be the transitional statement or the transitional paragraph, right? So you say, you know, given, you know, the historical package of colonialism, African states, therefore, understandably, remain very protective of their political independence, right? And that sort of stymies or stifles, stymie or stifle, right? It stymies or stifles their response to hot button issues that would require a more unified response. You understand the rationale down here? So this is why it becomes ineffective because 
when they want to respond to these hot button issues, right, what holds them back? You understand the rationale? So what can potentially hold them back is their sovereignty as an organizing principle and so on. Okay? All right? Clear? Clear? <coughs> All right. Okay. Before the OAU, you had the ECA, which was under the auspices uh, you know, of the United Nations, right? Uh, so, you know, it was uh, working with uh, the regional commissions of the United Nations, basically working towards sustainable development of Africa, right? So that's, you know, basically the idea of capacity building. You want to write that up, right? So it's very, it was recognized very early on that the entire region requires assistance, right, in terms of capacity building. So it's not just funding, right? You can just, you can give you know, any amount of funding uh, investment to a state, right? But in order for a state to be able to function independently, autonomously, it requires capacity building, right? So, you know, you've got research, uh, you know, policy analysis to help the capacity of institutions, right, within all of the African states and to drive regional integration. Basically, what the focus of the ECA was is to drive uh, or target Africa's development challenges, right? Particularly, you know, when you talk about development challenges, what are the challenges that face the continent or face the region, right? Basically, you want to look at the logic of poverty. You want to talk about things like anything that impacts human security. Maybe I'm going to write that down, right? Anything that impacts human security. So what are the, you know, under human security, as identified by the UNDP, right? There are seven, seven different elements, seven elements of human security, Food security, water security, health security, personal security, economic security. I cannot remember the other two right now. All right, okay. But there are seven different elements, right? The ones that we usually focus on is health, food, water, right? These are the major ones. Uh, economic security, like employment and income and so on, right? So these are the major uh, uh, you know, aspects of security. You can link that to the logic down here. All right, okay. So, you know, you're talking about poverty, eradication, you're talking about access to medication, health, uh, good governance of the continent, you know, as opposed to weak institutions, promoting uh, cooperation for, you know, the development. So this has always been the focus. Whatever organizations that come about, they need to tackle these kinds of challenges. If you do not mention the challenges, then your argument about why is it so imperative to have a regional organization Right, for this region, then will fall flat because we want to say that a uh, regional organization will then help to address all of these issues, all of these challenges, right, that confound states in the region. So it becomes something that is you know, urgent, right, and important. And then that would impact on your ass assessment to say that in a region where addressing all of these transgressions on human rights as a result, you know, of you know, poor governance and uh, you know, uh, state-sponsored, um, con uh, sorry, state-sponsored, uh, uh, you know, trampling of human rights, right? That means the state itself is trampling on human rights, you know, as a result of, you know, majority, minority, ethnic, ethnic cleavages, like what we saw in the Rwandan genocide, right? Uh, you know, that was basically a, a, a tussle between the Hutus and the Tutsis, right, over, you know, who controls Rwanda, right? So these kinds of things that motivate conflict, these kinds of things that, you know, motivate uh, or promote, you know, the, 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 the challenges or exacerbate, sorry, not promote, exacerbate the challenges, right? It becomes very urgent to have, you know, an organization that would be able to oversee, manage, you know, all of these challenges and ensure that, you know, progression is has occurred. But unfortunately, as a result of the veracity or the severity of these challenges, compounded by all the cleavages we saw, Right, and all the you know the inherent weaknesses that we saw as part of the background, right? All of these work against right the effective functioning of the IO. So in this case, your argument to say that OAU and AU are one of the weaker organizations, uh, you know, or weaker or ine more in ineffective organizations is justified. It's difficult. You know, remember this course, right? I always like to take the kindest of the gentler view, right? This is as, as kind and soft and gentle as I can be, right, in my assessment of the organization. Meaning, we are still taking a kinder, softer, gentler view. The pathology of the organization is driven by all of these challenges within the region itself. Can you see how to, you know, how this will impact your analysis? Okay? Okay? All right? 
Okay, sorry, I don't think I can finish early today. I talk so much, right? I give up. I I, I shall not. Uh, who was it just now? Somebody was right. I think it was Ipeng, is it? Or somebody who say, you know, he will not comment, right? He was right to not comment. I'll try, I try, I try, I try. Okay, but I don't, I don't think so. Maybe 55 can. Uh, all right. Okay, like I said, I'm not going to go through every single slide. I just want to pick out the important points. Okay. All right. So, uh, OAU. Right, basically, you know, we talked about the pan Africanism, right? Okay, so you link that logic, uh, you know, to the establishment of the OAU. So, this is the institutional origins, right? Uh, they had a conference, right? Uh, you know, in Addis uh, Ababa, right? Uh, in uh, 1963, and that was, you know, like the peak of, of explaining what pan Africanism was basically all about, right? And they wanted, you know, to basically have, you know, uh, you know rather than just have uh, pay lip service. Okay, I think that's a good way to express this. Rather than to just pay lip service to, you know, uh, you know, the Pan African movement, they wanted to crystallize it, condense it, right? Okay, I think crystallize is a good word. They wanted to crystallize it, right, from a movement of peoples, right, into a movement of states. And if you want to crystallize it, transit from movement of people to movement of states, right? Then you would need to have an organization, right? That represents this, right? But unfortunately, remember earlier on, we talked about the three different groupings, the sub-regional groupings, the Casablanca, Monrovia, and Brazzaville, right? There were these three different sub-groupings, right? Okay, right. So the dynamics between these three different sub-groupings actually play out very um very, uh, you know, publicly, right, in the creation of the OAU, right? Okay, so that's what you want to, uh, you know, highlight down here, okay? So what happens is that you've got the different uh, leaders or the different, you know, heads of these different region, uh, sorry, sub-regional groupings, right, uh, that, you know, were looking at creating the OAU as an or a regional organization, but they had different ideas as to how, right, uh, the regional organization should look like, right? So what you have is uh, Nukuma, uh, right, uh, who was basically looking at, you know, the, the logic of, you know, if you have a superpower intervention, right, then you have all of these newly independent, uh, you know, states and resource-rich states who can just easily fall into the cycle of dependency all over again, right? So what Nukuma, you know, basically uh, advocated was a union model for the OAU, right? So Nukuma was from the Casablanca group and he says, okay, you know, look at the challenges that are external challenges that are originating, right, from, you know, outside this block outside the region, right? And in order for us to, you know, overcome any of these external challenges, right, then we need to, you know, have a very unified grouping. So the Casablanca group had one idea, right? Then the Brazzaville group basically had, uh, you know, which were the franco Francophone states, right? They basically had a different idea, right? They basically wanted a looser association. So from the get-go already, right, cannot decide on how you want the organization to be. And you no, know, similar to the, you know, like how Hungary and Poland in EU are basically asking for, you know, intergovernmental approaches to integration and they don't and they want to have more control over integration processes. Same thing is playing out down here, right? Your Brazzaville is basically saying, look, you know, we should have a looser association. We do not want this united, you know, unity of African states and so on, right? Let us control the way uh, you know, integration actually occurs, right? And you know, so basically what you see is that they are more inclined towards economic cooperation as opposed to political integration. Bring in the idea when states wear their realist lenses, they're concerned about what? Gains, right? They're concerned about whether this integration is going to bring about zero-sum approach to gains or whether it's going to bring about positive sum uh, of interact, uh, positive sum approach to gains, right? If I'm going to be thinking about gains, right, any kind of economic gain that I can get, I will accept, right? Right? Whether you know you gain five percent, I gain ten percent, and, and so on, you know, it doesn't really matter. But if I have to give up, you know, any kind of uh, you know political uh, independence, right? If I have to you know compromise on my autonomy and so on. That is to do with political cooperation, with political integration. Am I still uh, am I still going to be saying like okay, we can we can take a you know a, a positive sum approach? They will be thinking about it in a zero sum approach because remember they are all newly independent. If they are all newly independent, they're wearing their realist lenses, sovereignty is an organizing principle, right? 
they are going to be thinking about placing self-interest. But what is your self-interest, right? The logic of the agenda of survival, right? Okay, so are they going to be so inclined towards political cooperation as opposed to economic cooperation, right? So if that's the case, if you're only inclined towards, if you're more inclined towards one type of cooperation, then, then you would be in favor of a looser association. Am I right? Yep. Right. If you are, uh, you know, if you're cool with either, you know, both political as well as economic integration, right? Then you would be more in favor with what Nkrumah was actually proposing. Can you see the distinction between the two? Right. And this is where you already see organization haven't really created yet, right? But cracks are already appearing already, right? Because of the way they are approaching it. Okay. All right. Did I skip accidentally, is that? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> okay. So this is where, you know, you start to look at, okay, you know, look at the way the different, uh, you know, factions within, it's a good word to use, factions, because when you have factions, what does that suggest? Does that suggest unity or does that suggest fragmentation, right? Uh, so you use the word factions and then you say, okay, this is what the objectives of the OAU were supposed to be, right? Unfortunately, the factions, right, you know, prevented it from achieving fully Right, these objectives that it laid out. So in the end, what these remain is they remain ideals, they remain goals to be achieved, right? But they are hampered or hindered. Remember, I always like use this a logic of hamper or help or hinder, right? You know how what what helps what hinders? Institutions tie your hands, right? Or attitudes tie your hands, or past experiences tie your hands. Or help or hinder, right? That's the logic down here, right? So basically, they wanted to look at you know liberalization efforts of colonization, appetite, of course, to promote unity and solidarity among African states in the vein of pan-Africanism, right? They wanted to promote cooperation for the further development of the region of the continent, right? Basically, very importantly, protect. Can you please underline that one? Protect sovereignty, territorial integrity of its member states. If you look at all of the different aspects of the goals and the objectives, right, perhaps that would be one of those that are starkest and one of those that, you know, all of the states were you know, basically more concerned with, right? Okay, it's about the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its member states. Come back to the idea of why they are so fiercely protective of it, right? That's the basic idea down here. And encourage international cooperation as outlined by the UN. Okay, all right, but I would say, you know, you know, while intention for solidarity, unity, and strengthen cooperation and so on, right, among these objectives already, you know, the, the main objective was basically for states to all focus on the logic of protecting sovereignty and territorial integrity, okay? All right, so, you know, among the objectives already, you've got certain ones that come to the forefront, okay? Then, you know, like what I mentioned just now, right? You know, you've already got the disagreements among the different groupings within the organization. So what happens at the end of the day? If you've got disagreements, right? And everybody has got a different approach to how the organization should be structured. You know, the disagreement between the Casablanca, Brazzaville and the Mondovia groupings, right? What does that finally tell you? When they eventually come up with the charter, it is going to be a compromise solution. Right? Because they all have different approaches, right? And if it's a compromise solution, how effective is this compromise solution going to be in addressing and being able to achieve all of the objectives that we highlighted in the previous slide? Correct? Right? So the important point that can you please underline? Compromise solution. All right? Because that captures the entire logic down here, right? Okay? So the rationale is that, you know, it, uh, you know, enshrined, uh, you know, what the Brazzaville and the Monrovia groups wanted. Right, as opposed to what Nukruma wanted, because Nukruma was from the Casablanca. Right, okay. So at the end of the day, you know, when you look at you know the the charter of the OAU, right? Basically, what is the flavor, right? That means what is the overarching you know theme, you know, that is behind the charter. Underline that reflected the statist interpretation of Pan Africanism. The last the last bullet point, statist interpretation. State-centric, state-centric associated with realism, state-centric associated with self-interest, state-centric associated with the state being the supreme uh, actor. It is the main unit of analysis, 
right? If the state is the supreme actor, the main unit of analysis, right? Then where do you get? How how do you reconcile that, right, with the logic of integration and cooperation, right? Right, common sense. I mean, that, that is a common sense approach to it, right? So that already tells you how it is beset with challenges, right? And look at the different, you know, um, articles within the charter. And what you want to highlight is what is the main feature of the, you know, charter? The significance of the principle of sovereignty, right? In various articles, of course, you know. You don't really have to, you know, uh, you know, specify and say Article One, uh, Three One, Article Three Two, Article Three Three, and so on. But generally, you know, just mention that Article Three, you know, provided several clauses related to the protection of the sovereignty, right, and the territorial integrity of each of the states within the organization. And this already, you know, is a counter to, you know, how if how far can you go with regional integration if the articles within the charter right, actually highlight the protection of sovereignty. Remember at the end of the day, right, IOs and the charters, the founding documents, they are juridical in nature. It is based on legalities. It's based on law, right? So anything related to the interpretation of law, if there's a dispute, if there's a disagreement, they come back to the charter and say, sovereignty is protected. Then how do you move forward from that? Right. Okay. So that is the problem. Just like how we say Article Two Seven, right, in the UN Charter, for you know functions as something block. Right. Same logic down here. Right. Okay. Only that this is Article Three. <laughs> okay. All right. So of course you know the OAU, right? Uh, you know unlike you know what we see in the EU. Remember EU last week we discussed right all of the different types of directives. You've got you know decisions. You've got recommendations, you've got laws, and so on, right? Uh, they, majority of them, right, they are binding. Down here, not binding, right? Okay, so it did not impose legal obligations. No legal obligations means not binding, does it? So what does that, what, what characteristic does that, you know, represent of the OAU? Toothless, right? Because not binding, right? How do you employ the law to enact? particular, you know, uh, directives and so on, right? Do the states need to listen to the OAU or the AU? No need. Not necessarily, I mean, not necessarily. It would be good if they did, right? Uh, or if, they, you know, they were structured by the idea of, you know, principles of uh, rules of membership and rules of behavior, and they follow the principles embodied by the entire organization, right? Then, you know, it, they would follow, right? But in this case, it is, they're not legally obligated to, Okay. All right. So, you know, notwithstanding this, you know, it did have a uh, surprising, you know, staying power, you know, from 1963 to about, you know, 2000s, you know, they, they, they did manage to remain, right? But, you know, the rationale is always, uh, you know, when we ask, we talk about the evaluation, right? Uh, is it, how relevant is it? How effective was it, right? Okay. So that was the main question. If the mission was never achieved, right? Uh, you know, is it uh, uh, an organization that is still required? Is it still important? Okay. How did it work? All right, okay. So this one, uh, I'm going to just run through very quickly, all right, certain things uh, because, you know, I do not expect, I do not expect you to be able, I mean, to write an answer that you explains right down to the nitty gritty of all of this. And you look at majority of the questions uh, on the OAU, right? Basically, it doesn't really emphasize, uh, you know, on the internal workings. When you look at EU, yes, the internal workings and the, you know, the internal, uh, structure, the infrastructure is important. Why? Because we talk about the institutionalization of the organization. We talk about the importance of the European Parliament or the various organizations within uh, like, you know, the, the, the central bank or the ECJ and so on, right? So there's specific questions related to that that refer to the empowering or uh, the importance of the organization in the various functions. Whereas with the OAU, right, not entirely uh, you know, so important in comparison to the EU, to the EU, all right? Okay, so basically what you want to, uh, you know, emphasize is the institutionalization and the strength of any of these sub-organs. So say, for example, the assembly, right? You're basically, uh, you know, the OAU resolutions, right? They have got no binding force. So in this case, right, uh, states, you know, can just function by consensus, 
basically come to an agreement, you know, uh, at the end of the day, right? So are they subject to any legal impositions, you know, by the assembly and so on? No, right? So this makes the, the institutionalization, right, uh, you know, very different from what you see in the EU, right? Okay, all right. Then you've got uh, the Council of Ministers, right? Uh, they met twice annually. You've got also important down here, the last one, Commission of Mediation, Conciliation and Arbitration, right? And look at the phrasing, designed to become a forum for the peaceful settlement of disputes between the member states. If sovereignty is an organizing principle and trying in Article 3 and various clauses, right, in the, in the uh, charter of the OAU, right, then what you have is a forum, right? Your commission of mediation, conciliation, arbitration is a forum. It's not exactly a dispute resolution mechanism or a dispute resolution body, like what you see in the WTO, for instance, right? It's a forum, right? It's for them to, you know, air their disputes and attempt to come to a peaceful settlement. But if there are no legalities associated with it, how do you effectively settle disputes? Correct? Number one. Number two, if you have member states of such varying capacities, some have high, le uh, high levels of hard power, some have low levels of hard power, they have soft power, or they have poorer economies versus stronger economies and so on, right? How do you simply just use a forum in order to negotiate and settle disputes, right? Especially when there is not enough juridical backing, right, in settlement of disputes also. So that becomes also very complicated, right? Okay. So each one of these highlights to you, right? Uh, you know, different aspects of not being able to fulfill, right, the, the original intentions behind the organization, right? Then you've got several different agencies, right, uh, you know, that, you know, attempted to support the work of the OAU. So you've got, say, for example, African Accounting Council, the Bureau for Educational Sciences, and so on, right? Basically, what you see is, you know, uh, you know, you've got contributions by member states, it receives funding, it receives uh, oversight by the United Nations and so on, right? But when you look at it, you know, there are so many different organizations within the OAU, also different, you know, sub-organizations and sub-organs. There's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of perhaps subsequently redundancy, right? And very similar to like what we call United Nations, I mean, okay, what do we expect? You know, it's modeled after the United Nations or receives, you know, oversight in the matrix from the United Nations. You're going to get the same issue. Remember we say United Nations, spaghetti junction, right? Similar idea down here, okay? All right. And, you know, a lot of the principal institutions, right, decidedly powerless. Why? Why is it that, you know, it doesn't have the authority or power to compel states? Because of that first logic of the principle of sovereignty that is enshrined in the charter, right? And the logic is that they went along with the rationale of a looser organization. They've gone with what Nukrumah had actually suggested about, you know, the organization of the United States, right, of Africa, right? You may not have seen it play out in this way in particular, right? And, right, the OAU charter, no provision for imposition of sanctions on member states. Subsequently, fast forward several years later, right, when Morocco invaded Western Sahara, right, and the African Union, which is a later iteration of the OAU, when they, you know, imposed sanctions on Morocco uh, for its invasion of Western Sahara, Morocco basically said, yeah, so what, whatever, right, and, you know, they just basically ignored it, right, uh, you know, and, the, and that was a protracted, you know, issue as well, right, okay, so that's basically, you know, what you see, right, uh, you know, and each one of these, you know, you may have uh, a, a significant network, right, of all of these sub-regional uh, groupings and organs and so on. Are they institutionalized enough? Are they empowered enough? Do they have any legal basis, right, or backing in order to function effectively? Answer largely is no. Okay. All right. Okay. <coughs> okay. The effects. Right, basically, you know, a lot of this we have already stated already, right? So basically what you want to highlight, right, is the principle of sovereignty. Your territorial borders are sacrosanct, right? There is a rationale of all states being supreme authorities. Because remember, I mentioned just now, 
the status interpretation, right? So if all say the supreme authority, then what makes you more powerful than me? No, we are not. We are on the, we are basically equal to each other, right? So there is equal say, right? No greater say given to larger or more powerful states or to the organization per se, right? They agree very, you know, largely to abide by the principle of non-intervention, right? Okay, that, so that's basically the idea down here. So at the end of the day, right, okay, when you look at, you know, the, the logic of, you know, the OAU, right, it seems more, like, you know, if you were to evaluate it, right, it seems a little bit more like a voluntary organization, right? Because states are coming together, they decide, you know, uh, I'm the most powerful, you know, I'm not going to listen to you. I will try to extract whatever benefits I can extract and so on, right? So it's like a voluntary organization that is, you know, um, limited by its own founding principles. That would be a very good statement to use, right? It allowed the realist agendas of the member states to dominate, right? And, you know, this is in total contrast to the supranational structure, the principles, you know, or even, don't even talk about supranational. It's in total contrast to the intergovernmentalist nature of the EU even, right? Okay. So therefore, you know, this is why we you know, come to this conclusion that it is, you know, one of the most, uh, sorry, one of the least effective, sorry, say wrong me, one of the least effective IOs, right, ever created, right? So, you know, basically when you talk about the pathology, right, it is, you know, basically the idea of, you know, all of these ideological cleavages that play the formation of the organization to start off with, right? Your Casablanca, Brazzaville, and, you know, Monrovia groupings, right? Even when they subsequently in the 1970s, they lost their, you know, the, the meaning behind the groupings, right? So the groupings subsequently were, oh, sorry, the groupings were initially important, right, in the structuring of the organization. Subsequently, when they lose the meaning in the 1970s, right, what happens is that your ideological cleavages, right, then subsequently start to affect, uh, you know, the way the membership, you know, is organized. How is it organized, uh, affected, sorry, how is it uh, affected? Okay, we have to get How is it affected? It is affected by the subsequent division, right, that is created by the bipolar structure, right, of the Soviet, uh, sorry, of the Cold War. Right, so the division between the Soviet Union and the United States, right? And why that becomes important, right, is that remember earlier on I talked about the crutch mentality created by the the you know the colonial legacies, right? And then you've got the independence movements as a result of decolonization. Then this problem crops up again when the African states become pawns, right, within the structure of the Cold War, right? Because now you've got the Soviets, uh, you know, and the US, right? Now looking for the allies, right? And again, it starts that division all over again, okay? Okay, so that is basically, you know, you've got the different alliances, you've got the capitalist alliances, right? And you've got, you know, the communist factions, right? Within the uh, OAU itself. So you start off by creating the organization, with all of these initial divisions between the Anglophone and the Francophone states. Then you have, you know, a, a compromise solution to creating the organization. And subsequently, it gets affected again by these differences in faction. So remember the logic about fragmentation and factionalization that I referred to earlier on? This is a recurrent theme that plagues the organization, right, throughout its history. Right, from the 1960s right up to the late 80s, 90s, right, and subsequently to the 2000s as well. Okay? All right? Okay. Let's do this, right? I would need to complete this, but it will just flow into the AU, right, uh, as a result of me explaining, you know, the different kinds of exam questions and everything. I used up a bit of time already, but it's okay, right, because I've only got a couple more slides. Uh, it's only got six more slides, right? Let's do this. I will continue this discussion right, uh, when we do the AU so that it will function as a bit of a recap and it will flow into the creation of the AU, all right? Okay, so I totally backtrack on my promise to finish earlier today. I didn't even finish the slides, right? Okay, but 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 uh, admittedly, you know, what I told you earlier on is important, right? So I would rather you have that knowledge about how to answer the question 
subsequently, you know, you can read whatever that is here. But I will still go through with you, lah. Okay, I promise I will go through with you. We will finish the last couple of slides up when I see you next week for the AU. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I will see you. I will see you all next week. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 See, Ipeng, you were right, now. You make the correct decision, right? To not have a legal binding decision and support my my uh lofty ambition. I was just as lofty, right? Ambition, uh, a, 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 ambitious as uh the AU, right? Or <laughs> the OAU. <laughs> okay. I'll see you all next week. Bye bye. Bye.